نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون وقد قال قال تبارك وتعالى في آية أخرى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رب صائم ليس له من صيامه الا الجوع ورب قائم ليس له من قيامه الا السهر صدق الله وصدق رسوله النبي الامي الكريم ونحن على ما قال ربنا وخالقنا ورازقنا لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين respected uh, young ones elders friends colleagues sisters listening at home and mothers this time between Salatul Asr and Salatul Maghrib in the month of Ramadan is perhaps better spent uh, in the recitation of the Quran and the Dhikr. But since your resident optician, Janabe Maulana Ilyas Saab, aka Alama Aini, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, has pressed me to share some <coughs> words in front of yourself. We pray that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gives me the ability to act upon this first and foremost, and that he makes the next 25 minutes or so a beneficial time for myself and everybody here. You know, we have a lot to be thankful for in Ramadan, especially when, like me, you're born into a generation where you've not necessarily seen the efforts that have gone before you. These majalis, the ability to sit and listen to the word of Allah Ta'ala, the kalam of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these masajid, be it the new Ashrafiya or the old Ashrafiya or Al-Falah or Zakariya or Iman or Judi, all within a, a, a mile's radius, or just the mere ability to fast and to turn up and take participate in the Taraweeh prayer in the evening. On the topic of Taraweeh prayer, I was reading in the Malfuzat of Hazrat Maulana Mufti Mahmud al Hassan Saab Gangoi Rahmatullahi, who was a very senior scholar. He was the Sadr Mufti, the Sheikh al Hadith of Darlum Diuban. He used to visit the UK, Rahmatullahi, in the 70s and 80s, perhaps even earlier, where many of our forefathers had perhaps just arrived, many of our granddads or grandparents. So he mentions an incident just on the topic of Taraweeh. Listen to this, yeah? Especially for those young guys like me that have jobs in call centers in the evenings and so on and so forth. He says that when the Muslims got to London, there were not many masajid and they used to work late night in the factories. Many of our elders, our elders will remember that zamana where the Ramadan was very late. Ramadan was uh, perhaps into the evening hours and many of our folk, they were still at work. So they requested the employer to say, please, can we take, get some time off just so we can go to the masjid and pray taraweeh. The employer refused. Okay. The employer refused. So instead, these Muslim employees, our grandparents, our great grandparents, they went to the employer with a proposal, which was eventually accepted that we want you to tie all our breaks together and we will call our Hafiz Saab, our Imam Saab to work and we will pray Taraweeh in the workplace and then go back to work afterwards. SubhanAllah, such was the zeal, you know, such was the zeal for ibadat, you know, such was the zeal. Nowadays, if we were even traveling or at work in the evening and we could not make it to Taraweeh Salah, we would not even think twice about, okay, okay, you know, we'll go the next day. But look at how the elders were before us. I can go on and on, but I need to keep to the schedule. I'll make one anecdote since we're talking about Taraweeh. Let's look at the blessing of I'tikaf. You know, many of us, we grow up thinking that I'tikaf is for old guys, for guys that have white beards. <coughs> That's the concept that we have. But you, the pious people of the past, and even today, they grew up taking part in i'tikaf as youngsters, as people not much older or the same ages than you and me. Hazrat Mawlana Salim Durad Sahib, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, he shared a very nice uh, anecdote from a 
Hafiz Saab in Leicester, who he was doing itikaf perhaps in the Dawah Academy. He was elderly, 70 years plus. And it just so happened that year that he had, he fell ill during i'tikaf. And everybody said that, look, you need to go to the hospital. It's okay for you to break your i'tikaf. But he would not listen to anyone. Finally, when they approached Sheikh, Sheikh Hafidahullah says that when I walked into his little area, his mu'takaf, where he was doing i'tikaf, this old Hafiz Saab, he started crying. He says to Hazrat Mawlana Sareem Saab, ke, I know why you're here. You're here to tell me and I'll have to listen to you as, my, as somebody I look up to, to leave my i'tikaf. But the issue I have, listen to his words, is that I have not missed or broke my sunnat i'tikaf for the last 50 years. These were people that you and me have seen. Such was their zeal. So moving on, I've already started to go on tangents. Today, I just want to cover as quickly as possible two main messages. Okay, two main messages. The first message starts with a question because I know that I'm perhaps the umpteenth speaker that you've had after Asr and Ramadan because mashallah, you know, it's uh, hard enough to get people together but in Ramadan, mashallah, there's bayans every day. So my question is very simply, what do you think we should be doing in Ramadan? Just very quickly spit out the answers because you've been listening to mashallah bayans. What should we be doing in Ramadan? Coming to your house for iftari? No. What did you say? Praying. Quran. I think that's perhaps what he said. Very good. Next. Nafals. Very good. Good. Young man. What do you think we should be doing in Ramadan? Fasting. Very good. Sunnats. Yes. Taking up ittabai sunnat. Very good. If I went around this room, I guarantee you that everything that we should be doing in Ramadan, collectively, we all know what to do in Ramadan. Where does the problem lie? Is the problem not knowing what to do in Ramadan or is the problem not being able to do what we need to do in Ramadan? Now, there is the ayat, remember that question. The ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and before, even before I asked you what to do in Ramadan, we all know what we shouldn't be doing in Ramadan, we should be trying to refrain from sins. So Allah ta'ala, when he mentions the purpose of Ramadan, that, oh you believe, ya yuhalladina amanu, oh ashrafiya walo, bolton walo, kutiba alikum usiyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum, Allah ta'ala says that this fast was there, prescribed upon you, as it was for those people before you, so that you may obtain taqwa. Now, without going into too much detail of taqwa, this state of god feedingness, this state of being having the ability to genuinely turn away from sins, this state where we can be so cleansed that we feel within ourselves the ability to do more good, be it taraweeh, extra sunnats, and all the things that you have mentioned. But then Allah Ta'ala, He mentions the clue or a clue to how we can obtain that taqwa in another ayat that I recited before you, which was, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe, ittaqullah, fear Allah Ta'ala, again taqwa, wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen, and be with the sadiqeen, the pious, truthful servants of Allah Ta'ala. So the question before I go into the next part is, in the last 10 days, or perhaps the next 20 days, how much effort are we going to make to be with the Sadiqeen? Coming just to the point of Quran, to drum this point home, <laughs> Mashallah, Shahrul Quran, I walk 10 people praying Quran, still praying Quran. You know, I find it interesting sometimes, especially as young ones, that we always, every Ramadan, we want to think of some miraculous new way to try to get too close to Allah Ta'ala. We want to try different things. But in the words of Hazrat Mawlana Ashraf Ali Thanwi Rahmatullahi, since we're sitting in Ashrafiyyah, Hazrat Thanwi says that the biggest ibadat that one can do in Ramadan is recitation of the Quran. And it reminds me of what Imam Malik Rahmatullahi says that when, you know, when we think things are old and mundane and boring and difficult, 
we feel that perhaps the solution to getting close to Allah needs to be something different. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with anything different. What I'm saying is that we need to value the methods that were in place since the beginning, since the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who also prayed Quran, listened to Quran, prayed Quran in the month of Ramadan to get close to Allah Ta'ala. And as Imam Malik says, لا يُسْلِحُ آخِرَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ that what fixed the beginning of this ummah, what was good enough for the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, is going to be good enough for the last person that came in this ummah, be it me or you. Now moving on to this concept of Quran, how were the Sadiqeen, how were the, proof, the truthful pious servants of Allah Ta'ala able to exert themselves in the month of Ramadan? We could sit here and speak about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his beloved Sahaba, mentioned about Hazrat Ali karramallahu wajhu that he had the ability to finish not one, not two, not three, but eight Qurans from start to finish in one day. Moving on to the zamana, the time of the Tabi'een, our great Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi and other Imams like Imam Shafi'i recorded that they were able to finish from Alif Lam Mim Dalik Al Kitab to Min Al Jinnati Wan Nas one in the day and one in the evening 60 Qur'ans in the month of Ramadan. Let's move further on as time progressed Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah one Qur'an in the day one Qur'an like we all do in Taraweeh but another Qur'an every three nights during his Tahajjud prayer. So you know what let's just skip one, two, five, six, seven, and ten years. Let's just go into our zamana, okay? Let's go into something very recently. The great Sufi giant, the great Sheikh Hazrat Maulana Muhammad Zakaria Khandelwi, Rahmatullah Alayhi. I'm just going to read out what he mentions about his Ramadan in 1384. And this is somebody who passed away in 1982, Rahmatullah Alayhi. Many of the Bazurgs, many of my elders, or Mashaikh, they will have seen this Sheikh with their own eyes. He says, Awabin, which is the nafal after Maghrib Salah, I prayed eight sparas. After Tarawi, I prayed one spara. And Tahajjud, I prayed ten sparas. And Chasht, which is the nafal prayer during the day before Dhuhr, I prayed six sparas. Just in the sunnats of Zohar, I prayed three sparas. After Zohar, Salat al Tasbih, I prayed two sparas in Namaz. And then two paras looking at the Quran. And after Asr, I would pray three sparas to someone. Hazrat Sheikh recited 35 Jews of the Quran as a habit in Ramadan every day. Now, this is the amazing thing. In another book, Hazrat Mawla Yusuf Mutala Sahib Rahmatullahi is entitled The Ramadan of Rasulullah. He mentions that when you looked at the food intake of this individual, when you looked at what Hazrat Shaykh would consume, Hazrat Rahmatullah writes that what me and you eat in one meal in Ramadan, what me and you eat in one meal in Ramadan, Hazrat Shaykh would not even eat that amount in 30 days of Ramadan. And yet he had the spiritual power to output what I've just recited before you. And then again, just to finish, top this point off, someone who I've seen with my own eyes, okay, we were not, uh, we missed out because we were too busy dossing around perhaps, drinking too much iron brew and allegedly eating fried mark bars. But has the Sheikh Ahmadullah lay zamana passed, but look at people in our time. And I might probably get in trouble for this, but I'll see it anyway. Hazrat Mawlana Nur al Haqsab, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, your maktab teacher at Zakaria Masjid. Okay. In the Majalis of Laylatul Nur, it was mentioned in a kitab that Hazrat Mona Nur al Haqsab managed to finish the Quran in one setting or in one 24 hour i'tikaf from start to finish two times in one day. When I went to Hazrat Mona Nur al Haqsab's house, Nibu Street, Nibu Street, China, okay, I mentioned to him that I read this about you in the kitab. And as I was talking to Hazrat Manur Haqsab, he kept saying to me that, Oh, I managed to do three. And I was a bit confused because in the book I read two, although we, with, as if two Qurans in one day is something not amazing. 
But when I finally asked him, he said, no, he goes, with the blessing of the Sadiqeen, with the encouragement and the company of these truthful, pious servants of Allah, with our Hazrat Rahmatullahi, it got to one point where I managed to complete three full Qur'ans in one day. Look, guys, I'm not talking about fairy tale characters. This is not Ninjago. Okay? Or perhaps give me a few other cartoons, Malilias. These are real people. Okay? Real period with real spirituality. But what the message I wanted to give you just in the first half is try and spend as much time in the company of the pious and inshallah you will have this ability to do just as much or definitely more than we are doing right now. Our Ustazi Muhtaram Hazrat Mufti Shabir Sahib Hafidahullah Ta'ala he mentions that in Ramadan there's three places you would go to take maximum benefit. One is the Haram even though the blessed Haram Makkatul Makarrama Madina Munawwara many of us go but unfortunately we end up wasting our time there too chasing Dunkin Donuts and other things. But generally speaking, the barakat of the haram is such that even a sinful person like me will try to do more in those blessed places. So one option, haram. Second option, just to make uh, Muhammad Bai Acha, well not to make him happy, but he'll be happy at hearing this anyway. Spend your time in Jamaat, you go in the path of Allah Ta'ala. That environment will inshallah give you the sadiqeen, kunu ma'a sadiqeen. And finally, the khanqa. Khanqa are these spiritual centers. You will see many mashayikh. They get invited to do a takaf somewhere or you go to some place where you generally get more out of your time. So that was the first point. And moving on to something related that doing as much good, okay, everybody has different abilities, okay. We all have certain limitations. I do less, perhaps Mulan Yasab does more than me. But what we can all do is try our best not to destroy our good deeds with sins. Hazrat Mufti Inayatullah Sahib, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, the Shaykh al-Hadith of Aapke Darlun Bolton, he would mention, ke, you know, that Ramadan, like we mentioned, Ramadan is like a medicine. Just as though we go to our doctors, we sometimes obtain a certain medicine. They may also tell us that stay away from such and such or else this medicine will not work. So just like this in Ramadan, if we are not going to build this ability to try hard to stay away from sins, then the spiritual benefit or our spiritual horsepower will suffer. We will go from 500 BHP to 10 BHP with one sun and we will not even realize it. The great Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, the Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala anhum, somebody asked him to complain to say, O oh, Shaykh, ma nastati'u qiyam al-layl. I can't stand for these long tahajjud prayers and pray lots and lots of Quran. And what did Hazrat Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala who reply? Aqadatkum dunubukum. That your sins have floored you. Your sins are so great in your spirituality that you physically cannot get up. And when you do get up, you cannot stay standing. Speaking of sins now and moving swiftly, because Mawlana Yasab has given me a strict time schedule and we should respect your time. In the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to move on to my second point. Okay? So summary of first point, inshallah, try to find the environments with the pious to exert yourself. Stay away from sins, inshallah. The second point, speaking of sins. Okay? If I went around this room, then just to wake you up, give me one sin. Okay? Just give me one sin that you think is a sin. Brother, Jumi Gunah. Ribat, good. Next, brother. Any sin? Fornication. Fornication, very good. Young man with the black jubba and the water in his hand. Bit too early for that. Ji? Telling lies. Telling lies. Bodhicha. Yep. Mole Yasa. Wasting time. Wasting time. Is that indication for me to hurry up? <laughs> Ajit, is there anything here? Zina. Zina, okay. Now, I could go around this home and we could probably count off more sense, okay? But the, why did I do that small exercise? There's no doubt that reading the Quran is a special virtue. There's no doubt in this. Or otherwise, these mashaykh wouldn't do that. 
But the Quran has rights over us. Number one, the Quran has the right to be believed, which is why you and me are sitting here today. Number two, the Quran has the right to be read properly, which is why you and me attend Tajweed classes and we pray as much Quran as possible. But it does not stop there. The Quran also has the right over us that we understand its meanings so that we can act upon the Quran. So the question I want to ask everybody here, and listen to me very carefully, is did we ever contemplate just like lying, fornication, fraud, our sins, that we, some of us, have gone through our lives thinking that it's okay not to make any effort to understand what the meanings of the Quran are. You become an engineer, you're happy. You become a doctor, you're happy. You become a dentist like me, you think you're happy. You become an optician, you have some maqam, some place in the dunya, your bills are being paid, you have a reasonable house. But not once, not once have you ever felt any regret that this Quran that has come not for my next door neighbor, but for me. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent for me. That I have never made even the slightest effort to understand what Allah ta'ala is saying to me. Allah ta'ala mujhe kya kehna cha raha hai? Many Muslims, in the words of Hazrat Mullah Sajjadad, Sajjad Umani Sahib Hafidahullah. Many Muslims, not just bad Muslims like me, but good Muslims. Quran padne wale front saf wale, big beards and jubbas, they are all included in this problem that we do not consider not making an effort to be a problem when it comes to the meanings of the Quran. As I mentioned, the Quran is not just for reading. The purpose is to understand its meaning so we can act upon the Quran. And the reality is that the reason why we perhaps think like this is that the dunya or our love for the dunya has crept into our hearts such that we do not even consider this to be worthwhile. You know, this one brother said something very nice that I used to wonder how the pious people would spend all night praying the Quran and worship. But when I seen people on their phone, on their Insta, on their Facebook, on their Twitter, on their YouTube feeds, on their YouTube shots for hours and hours of the time, I realized that, you know what, it's all about love. If Allah Ta'ala places the right love, the love of the Akhirat in the Quran in this heart, then spending hours with the Quran is no problem. And just look at our condition. You know, we get one notification, in Salah, our phone buzz and vibrates. Are you telling me that we just ignore it? Ask yourself, what do we do? We are now thinking, who is that? What is that? And it takes us away immediately from what our primary purpose is. We post something online and we're worried about the comments that somebody, or we're interested, eager to see what somebody has said, but we're not interested to see what every ayat is commentating upon our life that has been lying on our shelf for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and 50 years. You know, if we were in a situation that Allah, that somebody had given us something we were looking for, uh, results for our GCSEs, our A-levels, waiting for a job offer to come for, or maybe we've just made a marriage proposal. We would drop everything. We would not concentrate on anything until we found out what exactly that message was. So my dear brothers, my question is, is that Allah Ta'ala has been giving you a notification in every surat, and every spara, and every ayat, every single day of your life. But how much effort have we made for this? We are too busy. We are students, we are professors, am I work? You know, these excuses that we make, friends, we will regret this. Let it not be that we will regret this on the day of judgment. Okay, let's finally turn on the notification of the Quran, turn off all the other notifications that we don't need. And no, let us not be content with just being happy that we have studied other things in the world, but try and make an effort to study the meanings of the Quran whether that's with Hazrat Mawlana Muhammad Ali Sahib, your Imam Sahib, whether it's with Tafsir Dars, or with something that I will leave with you before I leave today. The Sahabi mentioned once, ke rubba qari, rubba qari lil Quran, that there are many people that recite the Quran, wal Quranu yal'anuhu. But the Quran, rather than it being a source of goodness, it curses him. 
Normally the ulama, they will say that this refers to somebody who doesn't correct their pronunciation. But as Hazrat Mawlana Sajjad Sahib Hafidahullah stated that this can also mean that that person that is cursing you because you've recited me, but you never made an effort to understand its meanings. And where does that leave us? You know, there's lots of problems to discuss. Every bayan, we could talk about topics, what's in your mind, what you think is important, what's bothering you, what's in this child's head, what's in that uncle's head. But Shaykh Al-Hind, Rahmatullahi, he mentioned something very nice after he came, after he was incarcerated to the, uh, the jail of Malta many years ago. When he came out, he said, I've thought long about the problems that the Ummah is facing. I've thought long and hard about all our problems and I've put it down to two reasons. One, there is no unity where there needs to be. And number two, is that the Ummah has left the Quran. The Ummah has left the Quran. So my dear respected friends, I just sticking to this time scale, finishing now, Alhamdulillah, under 30 minutes. Let's do tawbah not only from backbiting, from sinning, from looking at the wrong things, from girlfriends, from boyfriends. Let's do tawbah from this problem that we have of not even making enough effort to try and understand the Quran. The purpose of Ramadan, as we mentioned, is to try and cut our desires to control our nafs by practicing not eating, not drinking, and taming it to an extent that we can do more good. We can force ourselves to attend the majalis where we learn, where we with the pious, where the learning meanings of the Quran, not as a hobby, but as a passion, as a purpose. And inshallah, remember that you can read, uh, uh, we still try our best to read as much Quran. And on that note, there is a small uh, Quran class designed to teach the lay member the meanings of the Quran, um, starting hopefully in Bolton soon. There's a QR code which I leave on the member here. If anybody has wishes to join this class and there's nothing available locally, be my guest. The announcement will come on that group. Allah Ta'ala give me the ability to become a lover of the Quran, a genuine lover of the Quran. And everybody here, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanakallah wa bihamdik, Nashadu la ilaha illa and Nastafuruka wa natubu alayhi.